Um, I'm going to jump in, just wrapping up and, and highlighting and accentuating some of the, the concepts that, that I had introduced at the end of last class about the difference between individual transferable quotas in fishing versus, versus season limits. I posted a, a paper that has an interesting discussion of this. It was an empirical study of the difference between fisheries that have had catch shares or individual transferable quotas. These are, uh, I'm going to use those, those terms synonymously. Catch shares are are the same thing as, as individual, individual transferable quotas. These are property rights over a certain amount of, of fish harvest that you're entitled to over a given period of time. And so instead of, instead of having a free-for-all where, where whoever can take their boat out onto the open sea and catch fish, instead of having just a free-for-all like that, you have a, a right to a certain amount of, of fish over some period of time. So it depends on what, what, how the fisheries in particular is managed, but it's, it's a certain share of the total allowable catch, which, which you are entitled to by virtue of, of owning that, that catch share. Let me just point out the way that that kind of, the way that that kind of works is that the total allowable catch for a given, you know, for a given uh, point in time. So for like a given, over a given year, or maybe it's, maybe it's a six month period where that, the, the, the catch refers to that. But that, that's the, the total quota for the entire fishery that, that the government has set which in aggregate, the, the fishermen cannot go beyond. Um, and then that, that total allowable catch, which is sort of set in consultation with conservation biologists and population biologists, marine biologists, to inform what that right level should be so that, so that there is future growth of the fish stock and you're, and you're sort of keeping that, keeping that fish stock at a, at a large enough level where you're, you're guaranteeing <clears throat> more, more of it to be replenished every single year kind of along the lines of the, the growth analysis that we had done last time. That, that total catch, total allowable catch will be set sort of by the government authority uh, on, on an annual basis or a semi-annual basis or quarterly basis. And then your property rights, so the, what you own, what you actually own as a, as a particular fisherman is, is the share of that total allowable catch. You own some fraction of it. So your, your property right will be over some fraction of whatever number is set as the as the TAC, you know. So that could go up and down depending on how large the TAC is in a given year. But whatever it is, however that that amount is set, you will have a certain share of that that you're entitled to. And then so you take the the share and multiply that by the total allowable catch to get the um, you know, the total tonnage of fish that you're allowed to to take out over that period. And you're allowed to trade. You're allowed to trade your quota if if for some reason you are not uh, in a position to use all of your quota in a given period, you can sell that to, to other fishermen and, and make some money off of that. And so that somebody at least can catch the fish. And if for, um, for some reason you are wanting to catch more fish than is, is available to you in, in your quota, you have the ability to go onto the market and, and purchase a quota from another, uh, another fisherman. And so what this does, this is the paper by um, Birkenbach, I believe it's uh, Kazen and Smith. They did an empirical study of comparing fisheries. I believe it was 39 different comparisons of, of similar fisheries. One group had individual transferable quotas introduced and the control group did not, or the, you know, the, the other comparable fishery did not. And they looked at the way that they looked at the way that the the, the catch was distributed over the over the course of the year, under a, a catch share a catch share system or an individual tradable quota system versus a system that did not have catch shares. And so the one of the interesting graphs on here, I should say, without ITQs is the are the yellow, and with ITQs represents the 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 blue bars. With this graph here at the bottom that I just drew represents, there, there's a version of this in the paper. Um, they have some their actual results from, from different fisheries that they looked at. But what this is showing is that without individual tradable quotas, you have a lot of your catch happening very early in the season. You get a lot of, a lot of a lot, most of your fish catch is concentrated at the beginning as people are kind of racing to get, to get, get fish before other people do. Um, and then the catch, you know, declines. The, the, the height of this bar represents the share of the total annual catch. Uh, the height of this bar of these bars decline pretty rapidly as as you move along from the beginning of the year to the to the middle, 
without ITQs, without individual transferable quotas, you get a lot of concentration of, of the catch early in the season. Uh, but then uh, they, they look at the average, kind of the distribution of the catch for fisheries that have ITQs, and you get much less of a tightly concentrated a, tight, a, lot, a lot less of a tight concentration early in the season where you still have some, you still have more fishing in the early years. You still have the, your highest, your highest share of, of the, of the fish catch is going to be in the first month. Uh, your second highest is still in the second month. The third highest is still in the third month, but it doesn't taper off as much. And it's not as it, it's spread out a little bit more evenly throughout the year where, where the, the amount of, of total fish that are caught in, in the beginning of the, of the fishing season is still largest but it's not so concentrated all, all in that one month. That's, that's kind of what this empirical paper was able to, to show using comparisons between, I think it was 39 different fisheries that they compared one fisheries that had individual transferable quotas with, with those that did not. So you get a, a much nicer distribution, a much nicer distribution of, of fish that spread more evenly throughout the fishing season and throughout the year under a... Uh, individual transferable quota system, right? And so this has two, this has two effects. And I, I brought this up a little bit last class, but in the first, in the first place, it's very, it's much more advantageous for, for the, the fishermen themselves not to have to put themselves in danger trying to race to get fish before other people can get them. Not have to uh, go out in a short period of time, like during a short fishing season and go out and race, race out there with their boat and try to catch as many fish as they can over that tight window of time. They don't have to, they don't have to, to exert themselves so much in that short period of time. They're able to, to spread their effort, effort out more evenly over the year. That leads to, to fewer, fewer accidents, less, less likelihood of, of, of going out and fishing in, in bad weather. Remember, because if, if, if you have a short, a short fishing season um, and there's bad weather, you don't really care that, uh, that the weather's bad because you only have that short time to, to, to fish. Uh, you're going to try to risk it while the weather is bad. Whereas if you, if you own um, you know, a share of, of the total allowable catch, that's going to let you postpone your fishing if, if the weather is particularly harsh in, in one period of time. You can postpone it and wait, wait for, for better weather because you know that you're still entitled to a certain catch of fish uh, based on your, your, your quota that you, that you own. So it's, it's safer. It's also, you know, the revenues are higher for the fishermen because you're not, you're not dumping a huge amount of fish on the market all at once. When you have all of your fishing concentrated in one short period of time, you flood the market with fish in that short time, in that short, uh, in that short month. And the price of fish drops because there's so many fish. There's a, there's a market glut. There's, there's too many fish. Um, and not enough people to who want to buy it, and and so you get the price falling. So it's bad for for fishermen fishermen's revenues in that way. It's also bad for for consumers because when when you have that concentration of fish being caught and 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 used over just that short period of time, there's only a, a small window of time when fresh fish will be available. You know the fish fish are perishable; they don't last forever. The fish that that aren't able to be eaten fresh right away. Are, are then frozen or converted into some other kind of food product that's, that's less valuable or less desirable than, than fresh fish. And so the fact that you're able to spread your catch out over the year is not just better for, for producers' revenues and, and for, for fishermen's safety, but it's also better for, for consumers to be able to have their, their fish, more likely to be able to get fresh fish over different months of the year rather than all just at once. So that's, that's some of the arguments for why, why you might prefer a, a, a quota system as opposed to a, a season limit. There's another argument, which I had presented last class about overcapitalization and the fact that when you don't have property rights over uh, a certain amount of fish and you have to race against other people to, to catch the fish, you end up with having a lot more, a lot more boats, a lot larger boats, a lot more boats with, with huge engines that can go out really fast and try to, to get out to sea faster than other boats. You sort of get an arms race in a way. And we saw this in Iceland during the 1980s before they introduced a individual tradable quota system for herring. This was pre, pre-ITQ in Iceland. They had you know, 200 or so large fishing vessels active trying to catch this herring. And after the after the individual tradable quota system was introduced in the in the late 80s, and then once it sort of became fully operational in the, in the 90s, 
the number of fishing vessels dropped from 200 to 30. And so you had a lot less, a lot less capital and a lot less investment, a lot fewer resources being, being thrust into the fishing industry. Uh, at the same time, you actually had more harvest. So you had fewer vessels out, out at sea, fewer vessels being, being used, less investment in fishing capital, but you had about double the harvest in the 1990s that they had in the 1980s. And so this is, this is an example of, of just how the, the allocation of fishing quotas is a much more economically efficient system that doesn't lead to huge amounts of, of overinvestment in fishing capital. You sort of are able to scale back your fleet. You don't have to compete with each other as much for fish. You're able to, to fish in a, a larger stock that's a little bit easier to, to, um, to fish because there's more fish available. It's, it's easier to find the fish. And the harvest is larger because the stock is larger. And you know, for, for larger stocks, if, especially if you're, if you're moving towards, if you're moving from a, a stock that's, that's very close to the, to the, uh, the collapse point, the X min point, as you increase your, your stock from X min, you get a higher growth rate, more fish reproducing every year. And that's part of what was happening here with this harvest going up is you had larger, larger fish stocks reproducing at larger rates, getting more, more fish regenerating every, every year and having actually larger harvests than they did in the 90s when there was kind of a, a race to fish. Another example just of a, of a real world fishery, the Alaskan halibut fishery in the North Pacific, uh, after they introduced individual tradable quotas, the number of, of search and rescue missions declined dramatically because there was much less, much less risk for you know, the, the fishermen's lives. The, the number of people that got lost at sea was vastly reduced after that, that tradable quota system was, was introduced. So it was just overall, it's, it's, it's better economically. It's better in terms of consumption possibilities for fresh fish all year round. It's better for fisher revenues. It's better for safety. There's just a lot of reasons to, to prefer a, a quota system over a um, over a something like a season limit, where you, where you constrict the the season to a very a very small window. Um, I want to talk about the idea of of trophy hunting and talk about what I think might be an important role for trophy hunting in conserving the African landscape uh, in the face of kind of surging economic development in Africa. And I'm going to talk about this in the context of this particular lion named Cecil. Uh, who was hunted a while back, I think it was maybe 2013 or 15 or so, there was uh, a lion in Africa whose name was Cecil, and and a um, a trophy hunter from America went over with a bow and arrow and um, got a license to to hunt Cecil, you know, shot shot Cecil with a, with a bow and arrow a couple times and, and, and killed him and caused a, a pretty big outrage in the United States and, and around the world. It was a very famous case that had a lot of, a lot of very strong public outcry. And you know, on its face, it, it looks like it looks like kind of a barbaric thing, where where somebody comes in from the outside and and you know goes on this hunt and and hunts down this animal and kills it. What I want to do now is is I want to um, sort of present an argument for why this actually might be one of the one of the biggest factors that's going to allow the African landscape to be preserved. We've already seen a little bit of this this insight these insights previewed in the um, in the homework five, in the, in the Boudreaux podcast from homework five. But there was a, um, there was a bill that was introduced. It was called kind of colloquially, it was called the Cecil Act. This was basically a, a ban. It was a proposed ban on the import of trophy animals under kind of the auspices of the, uh, the Endangered Species Act, wanting to, wanting to preserve species, not just in the United States, but also around the world. And the idea was that if we, if we import, if we ban imports of, of trophy animals to the United States, um, we're going to get less trophy hunting and less less destruction of of the wildlife in Africa. And there is a um, a wildlife conservationist who works for an organization called the Property and Environment Research Center, and she gave a, a testimony before Congress, sort of talking about the Cecil Act. As, as the Cecil Act was being deliberated in Congress, she gave her perspective on on why she believed that that trophy hunting was actually perhaps the the biggest factor that could allow the African landscape to be preserved. And I want to just put forward that argument because I think it's a very interesting, perhaps somewhat counterintuitive argument that's not widely out there in, in the public discourse. And I want to um, just present that argument. It's, it's, it's an argument. It's not, it's not necessarily the final word or it's not necessarily the perfect 
exact right way of, of thinking about it, but it is one argument that I think needs to be contended with when you're thinking about conservation in, uh, in Africa. It's, you know, it could be right, it could be wrong, but it's, it's an argument. So let me try to outline um, sort of what Catherine Semser proposed in her testimony before Congress. I read that testimony and I, I kind of broke it down into 10 bullet points. And I'll, I'll go through each of those one by one. And so this, first of all, the, the, the first important thing to recognize is that the African continent is, is, is seeing ex- extremely dynamic economic growth. It's one of the fastest growing areas in, in, the, in the entire planet. Continent-wide, uh, it has about a 3, 3.4% growth rate year on year. But even beyond that, there's a lot of extremely fast-growing economies. There's you know, Ethiopia and Rwanda are both over 7% annual growth. Cote d'Ivoire, around 7% as well. Tanzania, between 6 and 7. Senegal, you know, but around 6. Ghana, around 6. There's a lot of extremely dynamic places in Africa, and it's, it's, there's a lot of cause for optimism there, just the fact that, that some of these African countries are able to engage in, in, in entrepreneurship and trade and are, are seeing their, their populations lifted out of poverty as a result of, of the, the commerce that they're able to engage in. This is happening on the African continent, and it's, 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 a, it's a very, a very positive development for humanity in general. One of the things that, that this comes with, though, is that there's a lot of um, economic development that's going to be paired with this, with this fast economic growth. A lot of development projects like highways, railroads, hydroelectric dams, uh, these things are going to have effects on the natural ecosystems in Africa. These roads and highways and, and dams are going to interfere with the, with the ecosystems, interfere with the fish populations, interfere with the, with the wildlife populations if, if railroads and highways begin to start to fragment the habitat that, that the wildlife are, are used to being able to um, roam across. And so this growth process is putting pressure on land use. It's, it's starting to, to put pressure on land, you know, to convert that into developed land as opposed to undeveloped land. And you might think of this, you know, like if you have, a, if you have an urban area and it starts, to, it starts to maybe expand, the fringe starts to grow. And as the, as the economy grows, the population might grow and it might start to infringe more and more on, on larger um, parts of the landscape and have a larger footprint on the landscape as the urban areas start to expand outward. And if part of these lands, let's say, you know, before expansion or, or, or as expansion is being, as being proposed, let's say there's, you know, part of this landscape, you know, overlaps with uh, where, where new development is being proposed. Maybe, maybe some of this new development would, would start to infringe upon important, important wildlife habitat. And it's very difficult to get conserved land to be able to compete economically with, with land that could be put towards use in, in sort of urban, urbanization kinds of uses, either residential development or commercial development or industrial development. It's very difficult to get conservation land to be able to compete economically with those other land uses. And with all of this, this uh, economic growth, there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of pressure to uh, you know, expand outward and maybe infringe upon some of this, this conservation land that that it currently exists in Africa. That's that's currently pristine habitat, but is is perhaps is under threat of being developed for for urban uses. And that's going to continue as as urbanization and um, economic development happen. And so Samser is going to argue here that that U.S. policy should be trying to minimize barriers to habitat conservation and not not erecting them. And so the way that that the way that that works is. We have trophy hunting representing a very economically lucrative kind of, of land use. Landowners in Africa who have either conservancy land or land that, that, that serves as, as valuable wildlife habitat are able to um, you know, make a lot of money off of selling licenses for, for uh, tourists to come and hunt on that land. And it's a, it's a, very, it's a very lucrative way for them to make, to make money off of conservation, off of, off of keeping the, the wildlife habitat conserved, off of keeping the landscape intact. And when you have development pressure, you might have land that the urbanization development pressures would, would be so strong that they could uh, easily outbid that, that conservation land and start to convert that to, to develop land very rapidly. But with the, with the introduction of, of opportunities for trophy hunting, conserved land all of a sudden 
is is very valuable and it has a lot of economic value that can actually outbid outbid the other kinds of developed uses of the land that's kind of what this uh point number seven is is saying here that this this trophy hunting opportunities represents a very viable means of keeping habitat land competitive with other kinds of land uses and, and one of the figures that Semser cites in her piece is that about 84 percent of of uh, Namibian conservancies would be would become insolvent. They wouldn't be able to pay their bills. They wouldn't be able to generate revenues above and beyond their costs. And they wouldn't be able to outbid other kinds of of land uses if they had to um, uh, rely on non-trophy hunting means of revenue generation. If they had to rely on just photo tourism, for example. So photo tourism is is one is one um, alternative to trophy hunting that that might be able to make some money where you have tourists come in and, and they just snap pictures of, of, the, of the wildlife and they don't kill them, they don't hunt them. That could be one way to, to offer economic viability. But it's just financially, it's just not as lucrative. You can't generate as much revenue from having photo tourism as you can from, from having uh, trophy hunting opportunities. And with, with the United States currently making up around 70% of the global trophy hunting market, this ban on trophy hunting might very well lead to a lot of land that's previously conserved getting getting developed, getting paved over, getting transformed, getting converted to other land uses if, if imports of trophy animals from, from Africa to the United States are banned. And so the argument, that's kind of the progression of the argument, is that Africa is, is developing rapidly. They're having a lot of fast-growing economies that are, are having a lot of alternative land uses that are very valuable. And the only way to keep habitat land conserved and be able to have that land compete economically with some of those developed uses, currently the, the, the best way to do that right now is to have communities being allowed to sell trophy hunting licenses, letting tourists come in, have trophy hunting experiences, provide a lot of money, infuse a lot of money into the local economy to do that. And that, that is going to be something that's going to allow land that would previously be um, converted from, from habitat and conserved land, they would land that would be previously converted from that to to develop uses that can be then preserved and maintained as as a wildlife habitat as opposed to being as opposed to being just straight up converted to um, other kinds of developed uh, industrial, residential, commercial kinds of, of uses or other kinds of um, large economic development projects. So that's that's a an interesting way I think that that United States environmental policy actually can have some some interesting unintended consequences on on the uh, the landscape of Africa and actually have a uh, US policy can actually have a a footprint on on the landscape of Africa if it's if it's banning the import of these animals it's it's possible that that could have um, some detrimental effects on on the African landscape and so that's that's the uh, the argument that Semster was making and I think it's it's a very interesting case of unintended consequences and incentives and the ways that property rights might be able to be used to, to foster more conservation on the African continent. So I will, I'll put that, that article, I'll put that on, on Moodle for you to read yourself.